Hi. Hey, it's Glenn from Alder Spring. I'm here on the ranch and I'm in an old swale that comes down through the middle of our hay meadows. And there's kind of an interesting um, companion I'm sharing the swale with. And well, interesting maybe not to you, but very interesting to me. And it is called Great Basin Wild Rye. An old boy I used to ride with, his name was Ed Corbett. Um, he's passed away now. I used to ride on the range with him with him when he was some 88, 89 years old. He was still quite a horseman and uh, kept me going in the saddle. We'd go full trot for some 35 miles a day. And by the end of the day, my kind of rear end was starting to ache pretty good, but he'd always tell stories along the way. And he called this grass, instead of ba Great Basin Wild Rye, he called it Great Basin Wild Life. And life it was. In fact, this valley that we're in right here is known as the Pasimari Valley. It's supposed to be an Indian word that is translated to mean land of the tall grass. And this grass is it. Basin wild rye can grow up to eight feet tall and uh, would be difficult um, to even find cattle land for it encompassed a large part of the Great Basin and the Inner Mountain West, and particularly these big valleys like the Pasimari, and covered them with these stands of lush, very tall, very dense grass. The settlers, when they came, would turn their cattle out in, in them in a lot of the uh, Bonneville country in uh, northern Utah. And they wouldn't find their animals until springtime, when uh, a lot of it was eaten down or knocked over by wind or snow. And that's when they'd recover their animals and they'd do it all over again. The buffalo also thrived on this grass, and it was the foundation of the food chain in a lot of these intermountain valleys. Now, unfortunately, it's common, but not dominant. Agriculture moved in, settlement, and uh, the distribution of the grass has changed. We still see it along roadsides and in wild areas like this little swale, areas that didn't subject themselves too well to the plow and homesteading. Um, the other thing that... Uh, turned out to be the demise of Great Basin Wild Rye was grazing. Buffalo sustained themselves very well on it, um, as did other ungulates like bighorn sheep and uh, deer, and used it for a lot of winter protection and cover uh, when winter winds would come down out of the north and howl and uh, temperatures in these valleys would get to be 30 to 40 degrees below zero. Great Basin Wild Rye provided a lot of protection on that and feed value. But it was year-round grazing that actually um, contributed greatly to the demise of this beautiful plant uh, because it can't handle it. It can't handle getting grazed all year round. Uh, but it could handle getting grazed seasonally or in little bursts like the buffalo did. The buffalo were always on the move and never camped out in a spot for a very long time. The settlers didn't know that though and they turned out all their cattle on uh, the stand of Great Basin Wild Rye thinking, well, they don't even have to make hay here. It was a beautiful situation for early settlers, especially in northern Utah and southern Idaho. They turned their animals out and they came back fat. And they lived all the way through the summer on it as well while it was trying to grow. Well, it didn't disappear, but it sure had a hard time with it. And it shrunk down to those areas that didn't experience year-round grazing, didn't experience the plow. As a result, we put a hot wire around our uh, Great Basin Wild Rye stand so that they'd increase in density and we've even tried planting in some areas, but it's, it's tough to get started. But it's a beautiful grass. It's elegant, seeing it wave in a gentle wind. It was our prairie grass in the Intermountain West. Anyway, hope you enjoyed listening. Um, you have a great day and happy trails.